Today's guest is Blaine Higgs, the leader of the Conservative Party of New Brunswick. Welcome, Blaine. Thank you, Dennis. Nice to be here. Thanks so much for taking time. Appreciate it. It's busy. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon and uh, away we go. Uh, to start today's announcement, you guys were just filling me in. Sears has made its announcement that it's um, going to fall for bankruptcy. Of course, that's been a dominant story in our political agenda the past five, six or more months. Thoughts? Uh, yeah. Well, yes. Uh, so they have uh, filed for creditor protection and, and announced some layoffs and stores closing, I, I guess two in New Brunswick alone. And, and uh, it's... Um, it's concerning for on, on a couple fronts. I mean, certainly Sears is a is an icon here in New Brunswick and has been around across Canada and in, uh, in the U.S. for for many many years. And so, that's sad to see to see um, the, that that chain impacted as it has has been or appears to be going to be. But it's also um, you know the other sad part of it is that not long ago the government made some serious investment to um, to create call centers here for Sears and. In both St. John and Emerson, and and you know all of the all of the tea leaves were were pretty clearly pointed in the direction that Sears was in financial difficulty. Because yeah, something like this doesn't happen in a six-month yeah. window; it happens yeah. over a few years. They they had lost uh, dramatic um, capital within their within their shares, and 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 as a as a result, it, it was a it was a decline that was trending. You know, every every report, every quarter. So here, here we go. You know, with the, with everything pointing that this is not a sustainable organization, uh, we we invest as a government and say, you know, we're going to. This is a big news story. Hmm. So it just it just tells you one more time how badly um, the public uh, perception is in terms of a government wanting to put something out there that looks like it's good because we're going to create jobs. We're got a company like Sears investing in New Brunswick, when when all along. The reality is that no, the, the the company's not really investing in New Brunswick. They're actually divesting now, as we see from a couple of stores closing and others. But but they 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 wouldn't come here without without financial help from the province. So it didn't matter what their numbers looked like. It didn't matter that they were going bust. The government wanted a good news story, and that was going to be it. And they hoped for the best. And that ties to two themes that run consistently through New Brunswick politics, maybe the past 30, 40 years. One is the relationship between business and government, and what is that relationship, and can it be better? And the second thing is about how do we do things better so that if government does take public money and put it in behind business, that it actually creates long-term sustainable jobs. Um, can we play in that space for a bit? Because general public, in some ways, some people will, will paint both uh, liberals and conservatives somewhat the same. They'll say, oh, we've seen this practice before. Um, there'll be a cynicism attached to it. And it would be nice to get past that cynicism to find where is the dynamic where there is a positive relationship between government and business and that this is the right investment at the right time. Like the progressive solution mm -hmm. instead of a uh, got a good photo op and we're going to buy two years this way. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. It's been a generational thing going from party to party where, where we've seen questionable investments into, into one company or the other. And, and at the point where it starts to improve is when you have a, a stability within the system in terms of, well, what's our tax rate? What are the tax rates going to be? Both, both personal tax rate, you know, both corporate tax rate, small business tax rate, property tax rate, all of the costs, the fees, structures that are associated with a business operating. How do we look around the country and say, we want to be best in class in, in what makes a business profitable in our province, but not because we hand them the most money. It's because we provide them the best environment to work in. And they can tell their friends, and they can tell their friends, and they can start to invest here. We don't have that, that sort of environment because every new government comes in with its own brand of, of, of solution, and it's a solution about give, how do I give companies more money so that they will come here. Um, that has to stop. Our situation has to be such that we want investment in the province. Mm -hmm. We want to help private sectors invest in our province. They need to have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. If we're going to get involved in any way, shape, or form economically, um, we need to have equity shares. We need to have a re investment, a return on our investment. Because the money that taxpayers that are putting into this, it's not about having a, a new hundred million a year to, to invest every new government, every new budget. It's about 
I give you 100 million and I want you to invest it in the best opportunities around the province and I want a return on that investment so I can continue to use that same 100 million over and over and over again because I'm getting value for it and I'm generating the right uh, revenue from it. Uh, the best scenario are, are the right conditions to have people want to invest, not government inventing a, a public political solution. So that would fine tune that conversation around is it the government's role to create jobs? And for you, it's clearly not. I mean, it's so closely connected to it, but the right environment. It's closely connected, yeah. and that and that's that's where you look at the uh, the opportunity with. Um, well, as an example, if I use a, you know a comparison with universities and in, in uh, both private and in, in public universities, and and when I was talking with with some private universities and I asked them, um, you know, they said the enrollment has been pretty steady. Now this was all before the TAB program came along, but the the enrollment had been pretty steady and. And, and in fact, it had actually gone up. And I said, so what, what, why do you think it's gone up? Because most universities are saying their, their enrollment is going down. Um, and they said, well, we spend a lot of time matching curriculum with, actual, uh, with the actual educational courses uh, or what we see in the marketplace. So our mm -hmm. curriculum that we provide is what we see as a market demand for jobs and, and opportunities for people when they graduate. And you had this conversation recently? Well, uh, probably well, four months ago or five. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's recently. Because another one of the narratives is the disconnect to some degree between universities and the graduates they generate, and then the yeah. job job availability. Yeah, so it's the same. It's the same issue, yeah. and but the private ones have to have that because they don't get funded the same way. Right. And in order to get to, uh, students, they have to have a program that actually allows a student to get something out of it. Yeah. So there's a different dynamic. But the same thing goes to a, a business and, and investment in the province. It's how do you create the right conditions that, that and, and you spend a lot of time working with companies to understand what those right conditions are. Not, not handing over money, yeah. um, but what's the right condition for you to want to be in New Brunswick? Well, how quickly with, uh, I'm remembering a story from four or five, maybe 10 years back, um, immigration was part of the solution. Um, but that was closely connected to something else that that story didn't want to cover because they isolated the story as like a, a silo or one topic, which was second language training. So on one hand, here's an encouragement for more people to come to New Brunswick, but we dropped or created more obstacles on the second language training. So on one hand, it looked like it was a progressive move forward, but that climate, you know, on the other hand, we got rid of, you know, apprenticeship program dropped, um, the second language training uh, dropped. So... That would mean a, a, a very different approach within your, your group to how we do politics. Because each one of these stories that we'll pick will point to a general theme about things, need, politics. things need to shift. If, if so this, it doesn't matter the topic, but the, the bigger story is the shift that needs to It be. doesn't matter the topic. The shift has to be clear in every sector. I mean, we've been talking about growing our economy. So, pro so government comes in or on a campaign trail and promises, oh, we're going to grow the economy and create more jobs. Well, I think the number on this last round was 10,000 new jobs. Yeah. Well, look at the statistics. And, and the premier himself was actually going to be the, the um, head of the jobs board. Well, it would help if you'd, you'd had a few jobs prior to that, yeah. maybe, if you're going to be head of a jobs board. Yeah. But, but the point... The point is, you can't come. No one comes equipped for that. You 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 need to build an organization that's always looking to continue to improve. You can't just spin over a new change every four years or every eight years, and think all of a sudden uh, I'm going to come up with a solution. Yeah. You build on a on a success and a, and a, a continuous improvement kind of program in every sector, and with with economic development, it's like how knowledgeable are the people in the departments that actually can look around this province and say, where's our niche opportunity? Hmm. Where do we have an opportunity? It's not wait for a government to come along and invent this, but be building and, and identifying every day. So when a government comes in to say, look, we've been doing a study around the world. Here's something that works for New Brunswick. We need to get on side and we need to find ways to make our province attractive for this particular industry or this particular venture uh, because it is, it's real so that you have consistency in the evaluation, the, the view beyond a, an election cycle. Yep. It has to be the 15, the 20, the 25 year view. Yep. This short term recycle program we have here, is, it's yeah. got to stop. Yeah, it's done. It, it's run its course. Um, we waited the 40 years to see if it would produce results. It's not producing results, so we have to go back, check our premise. Mm -hmm. in, in prep for this interview, um, a couple of things surfaced for me. It's always interesting to see what wants to surface rather than uh, you know there's an agenda. One. So one of the things that surfaced 
There's been a, a lot of stuff, a lot of news stories recently about automation, artificial intelligence and robotics impacting uh, workplaces. There was a big story last week in Sobeys and the retooling they're doing in their warehousing. Um, tied to that story was related uh, bits of context about uh, the food service industry in Canada employs 3 million people expect in the next 10 or 15 years, you know, 95% of them are going to be out of work. Mm -hmm. um, those like that's unprecedented. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. how, how do we begin to prep Little New Brunswick with uh, adaptable political leadership to a systemic change to that degree? It's, it's going to be an interesting time. And I suspect it's going to take all of us to figure out what that solution is for us. It, it is indeed going to take all of us. And it's going to, it's going to take uh, uh, blurring the political lines in order to find solutions in any camp that, that can help drive a change. Mm -hmm. I, I think it goes back to the, the original um, the original kind of thought of how do we create a, a, a talent pool that is looking at those shifts in, in, in our society that are basically saying, look, we've got to think differently here because this is coming at us and, and this has to change. Well, do you think that that's going to happen on, a, on any particular campaign trail? It, it isn't. It won't. It would be interesting if it did. It would be interesting, but how, what, what's would going to bring that, that sort of view or intelligence to the, to the program? Because it's, it's like you, that takes an analysis of what is going on in society <coughs> around us. It takes some in-depth look at what is changing in, in not only New Brunswick and Canada and you know, in other countries around the world that's going to impact New Brunswick, that's going to impact Canada. You'd like to think there's a national strategy that's basically saying, <laughs> what's out there that's really going to have a, a face change impact on us? Yeah. And I mean, it could be like um, we've seen with the forest industry in the sense of what big step change in the decline of, uh, of usage in, in the forest products and in the, in the decline in the necessary mills. What could happen in the oil industry where all of a sudden, you know, there is that, that innovative approach in electric cars and, and, and it could happen over like, like Kodak, remember? When yeah, the, Kodak, the changes like, will happen quickly in some cases. They will, but yeah. that but, but doesn't mean that, you know, people are looking at this. I, I, I know a, a little story that years ago when I was uh, 10 years old, I was in, in New York City at the World's Fair. Okay. And, and I, was, uh, I went to a General Motors pavilion and I went through this and it was a history of transportation. Mm. And when I came out of it and then in, in the foyer at the end of it, there were all these cars of the future. And guess what was one thing in common with these cars? No steering wheel. <laughs> they they, they the just coordinate car. driverless car. They just cord, you put in your coordinates and then you, then you sat back. Now that, that really upset me at 10 years old. Because I said, here, I'm not going to have a license for another six years. And by the time I get there, there'll be no more driving cars. Yeah. And, and there I'll be. Yeah. Um, but I'm quite happy now if it came to fruition. But I guess the point was, here's a, here's a technology yes. that is out there 50 years ago. Yeah. And, and it's just now kind of making it to the roads and being tested in, in yeah. some areas. Like I think Ontario is testing this, this technology. Well, how many others are there that you, you might say, that's got potential at some point. And when you talk about robotics, I mean, that's been around a yes. long time. Yeah, but the application of it now is is, is moving is moving further. But why has it been moving, and why is it more of an issue? Look in New Brunswick. You know, when you look across the province, we have difficulty filling jobs. Just about every company has difficulty filling jobs. So, so why is that? People don't want to do these jobs. Well, okay, what jobs do people want to do? And, and then are those jobs available? You know, we have become a very demanding society, and, and, and we want Sorry, to do what yeah. we want to do. But it's true. There, there's another shift that's occurred, which is the public, of course, and expectations yes. within the public. That's right. And their responsibility in this conversation and in this it, It's real. Rather than us and them, you know, what are you going to do for me? Yeah. That dynamic needs to go away. That's part of the narrative so, shift as well. I hate to think that shifts like this to automation are being made because society has decided we're just not going to do that. I mean, we're going to see shifts to automation because companies are always going to be driven for their profit margin. And they're always going to keep trying to find a better mousetrap. Yep. So that's, that's a natural evolution. But if, if you find that we have a step change here because we have a large uh, segment of our population that just says, I'm not going to do that. Yep. Well, now we've got to find an innovative solution. Yep. And then there will be a cry, well, there's no, there aren't any jobs. Hmm. So it's a catch-22. Yep. But we, well, I think, again, talking about a little old New Brunswick, 
we have a situation right here, small enough yes. to look at these individual problems yes. and say, okay, let's let's just take us as an example. I mean, I was up in the, in the Madawaska area, uh, in the northwestern part of the province here a few weeks back. The employment rate is like four and a half percent. Can't find people to work. Yeah. And it's, it's, this has been ongoing for a long time. So, you know, the jobs aren't pouring on the streets. There's no question about that. And, and, and they haven't yeah. been and they, and they aren't. But these are jobs that have been not able to fill. And so foreign workers are being looked at. Yeah. And that, of course, goes back to your comment about the language training. If you're going to bring in foreign workers, you've got to have access to train. Yep. And uh, so there's a, there's a lot of dots that aren't connected here on a philosophy moving forward and how automation is going to impact New Brunswick and what's driving it. As I listen, um, so many different tangents and thoughts come to mind, but one of them that surfaces quickly is that role of robotics and artificial intelligence and the impact it's going to have, whether we like it or not, it's coming to some degree and will impact our little province to some degree. But I've read in other places that the counterbalance to that is community, that when people get together and decide what they want to do, and you even slid that in in your talk just now, said, well, people get together and decide what they want to do. And, and how to mitigate or, or buffer it or embrace it and make it fly. And we're so small, 750,000 people geographically, we have access. Um, is it possible that one of the breakthroughs that needs to occur or may occur is the politics shift into more of a, it integrates that community field a bit more? Uh, that might sound odd because politics already is integrated with community, but yeah. we, we need it to shift a little bit to to offset what might be coming that's so large that we just need to figure out what to do best for New Brunswick. And what's in the back of my head about this is food and food production and food security. Well, uh, yeah, I, I guess if I'm thinking in, in, in one part, politics integrating. So, so we have tremendous shifts in, in views and values from one political party to another. Um, so where do we find the commonality? You know, and if I was to use like one issue, so if you, if you, if you say, well, um, what is the unemployment rate in the province? So we're running at 11%, but in pockets we have, we have employment opportunities. But then when you have nationally, the word is, well, it's a way of life to be on unemployment in New Brunswick. Well, what's, what's, that, what's that about? Yeah. How does that work? Yeah. Uh, because, because the thing about the way of life is we value our way of life, and we all need to find a way to contribute to it. And unless we kind of get some common themes, and I, I will often talk about four or five key indicators, uh, where we have a agreement, you know, this is a foundational type of philosophy that we can't keep shifting for political benefit. It has to be, okay, th this is where we're going with this. Yep. You, can, you can apply that to education, because we're eighth in the country for how long? You can provide it to, to uh, poverty reduction, because you can't measure that we've had any improvement in poverty reduction. Mm -hmm. You can private to put it to economic growth in the, in the province and, and you see that as, a, as been you know, stagnant with minimal growth and there's no big horizon, uh, there's no golden goose out there. It's yep. a philosophy that you, car you build on and you start to, to grow. Um, so there's so many health cares, the other one you can provide, look at that and say well how much better can we be because you look at wait times, you look at um, families without doctors, you look at our chronic or our are critical illnesses that, that are not getting treated in, in a, in people say, well, diagnosis is key. You need to be diagnosed quickly. But then you get into a situation that, wow, you, you, you got to wait four months. You got to wait a year. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I had that, I had a similar thing happen with me. Uh, and the doctor said it was critical that I got, I got seen within, uh, this has been back five or six years ago, within uh, the, uh, about, a month or two, he said. Uh, he said, if you if you've had this condition, and it was an arrhythmia problem in my heart. And he said, if if you've had this condition for a long time, then the odds are you 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 won't get it out. And and this was so that was like we first kind of figured it out, say probably back in two thousand eight. Um, and and it was uh, I said, okay, so what do we do here? And he said, well, we need to get you in for a cardioversion. I said, all right, well that's good. So uh, when are we going to do that? Well, I'll I'll get you on blood thinners and we'll get you in. So this would have been like a June. Yep. I didn't get in for a cardioversion until November, middle of November. Now, I was told it was it was sensitive in time. The longer it was out of rhythm, the chances are it would stay out of rhythm. And and the cardioversion didn't work. It took a while before before I finally got it back in rhythm and got yep, it sorted out. Yep. But but the point is, if if we have critical requirements, yep. and some could be a lot more significant than that one, 
and you need treatment, you need diagnosis, you need, you need a path forward. And people are at home wondering why, why, why am I sitting around the home when I, they've been told this is critical. Yeah. Those things to me, it's unacceptable that we can't find a common path to fix this. Yeah. And, and get on, a, 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 as again, I go back to a, a continuous improvement program. That'll be an interesting narrative for the next 18 months heading towards uh, the next provincial election. In support of that, and interesting you brought it up, um, about um, this province, because part of what you just did was um, one of our narratives, is we describe ourselves by what we don't have or where we're failing, especially on the national scale, it's so frustrating about New Brunswick. That McLean's article from last year just was very irritating because that particular writer picked a very narrow perspective and support photos. And um, Because the Conference Board of Canada recently released this study and New Brunswick comes out number one in Canada. But media don't pick it up as a big story. And if, if you'll allow me, um, which, prov which provinces rank highest in the Society Report Card? New Brunswick and Quebec are the top ranked provinces, earning a B grades overall, placing behind Nordic countries and the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and, uh, and Australia. New Brunswick ranks 10th among 26 comparator jurisdictions. The province scores an A on grades on three of the 10 indicators used to compute overall grades. Um, and, and there's more. But that's exactly what you're talking about, this, this environment that we have here that's positive. And it's really good the Conference Board of Canada recognizes it as, as something that's a great place to live. So somehow we've got to... And we all know we, that. We've got to bridge that somehow to how mainstream media keeps painting us in this negative light, recognizing we've got some challenges, but compared to Ontario and Quebec, oh, I'll take where we, <laughs> where we need to go because of scale. And then there's factors, other entities out there that recognize um, the beauty and wonder of, of our structure that we've got here. They, they do. And, and I guess for me, when I look at the report, you know, there are categories that are picked out. said, oh, New Brunswick ranks first or second or third in this, in this category. Um, if you look at down to the others, you know, what, what you do, if you, if, you were a, if you were a company and you were looking at a report card like that, yep. you would say, okay, well, that's great. I'm, I'm really glad where I'm strong. Now, what do it need to do to fix where I'm weak? What do I need to do to plug those holes on the areas that can, can make me may put us number one overall? So you don't, you don't, because I'm sure that, that, that there, there's, there's, there isn't any strategic plan to help raise the bar to a point where we're number one. And, and it's the same as any strategic plan in order to change the game in, in areas that, that we know we need to improve upon. And, and, and I mentioned a, a list of them. So I, I think that the areas that we find that people are, are struggling with is their ability to, to uh, live and work in the province um, and find employment, but then the tax system is such that they feel, well, why would I pay these kind of taxes? Why would I, why would I not uh, move somewhere else and pay less taxes? And especially if I can find a job somewhere else. And, and so you can't keep taxing people as the only avenue of, of uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. there, there's no innovation involved in taxing people. Yep. And you, know, you, you mentioned it before the program started, you mentioned about, um, about the deficit. Well, you know, in, in the scenario with this government, um, they are ba basically have raised taxes up in the order of 700, 750 million dollars. Their spending has increased by 900 million. Mm -hmm. And so you, you say our deficit now with the HST should have been we should have been a surplus, because they were there when they arrived. the The deficit had gone from the eight thirty nine hundred, which you mentioned. Yeah. It was at three seventy seven, and going down. Yep. And it went in the next quarter, in the third quarter of the year they arrived, to two eighty nine or two eighty. It's in that range. And then guess where it ended up at the year, the end of the year, back up to right on budget at four eighty eight. So how did that get from 288 up to 488? Just dump spending into that year, in order because they said we got budget room, we blame it on last year's mm -hmm. government. Plus, it gave them an opportunity to to reduce from 488, but then bringing the HST on, which we had no plans to put on, we didn't need the HST, yep. but we weren't planning to increase our spending by 900 million either. Yep. And what we saw was better ways to deliver service, get results and not tax people more. So is one of the emerging themes then to um, that the solutions aren't going to be about spending more money? 
That's exactly right. The solutions are not. And, le and let me use a couple examples. So Richard Sayon in the book Over the Cliff, and then then the following, uh, he's written two books, and then um, basically, you know, the 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 first book more so than the the second one, that was re was related to we need to grow the economy. We have an aging demographic, and when I met with Richard and I was showing him at the time I was in finance about the number of areas that. Uh, the partners were getting better, better results for, for the money we're spending for taxpayers' dollars. And, and when I, when I uh, met with him, he talked about, well, we need to grow the economy, we need to find more, job, make more jobs. I said, yes, indeed, we need to have more, more jobs here, we need to have a stronger economic climate. But I said, it won't fix it, Richard, it won't fix it. And, and he, Did he get it? Well, he wasn't so sure. He thought it would fix it. <laughs> okay. now, now, then, then afterwards, um, I, I said, all it'll do is sustain the inevitable. And, and so then, um, you know, we've met after that and we've talked more about it. So there's two classic examples that supported my line of thinking. And it was Newfoundland being one, where they had record revenues in, after the royalty revenues. And, they, and all they did was grow their spending habits to match their revenue. And then when oil prices drop 60%, they are a basket case. They are in trouble big time. But, but they, they did it to themselves. They just spent whatever came in. So then you take this government, um, when they brought the HST, many people thought, oh, well, I'm willing to pay the HST because we need to get the deficit down. Mm -hmm. Well, don't they look around and say, well, shoot, you know, if they didn't build a twin highway that we don't need and we don't have the cars to support it, that's five or six hundred million. Yeah. If they didn't build a bridge that wasn't required to be fixed because no one was asking for it, um, that's another 60, 70 million. Mm -hmm. If they didn't throw money at Sears, if they didn't throw money at at um, Enbridge and, 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 and all of these companies and, that, and not deal with the issues that are really costing us a lot of money, we wouldn't have a deficit, would we? We wouldn't need the HST, would we? Yeah. We wouldn't need to tax people at the highest rate in Canada. I, it's for the life of me, I have such difficulty trying to figure <laughs> out why m people don't match up this excessive spending spree all for the sake of buying votes with what they themselves could contribute and have as a result of prudent behavior in the political circle. Yep. And, and because that's all it is. It's, it's, the system is, is broken, the system is abused, and it can be fixed. But it won't be fixed through a spending program. Your story reminds me of a parallel story in the um, voluntary sector where, um, just as an example, uh, say there's 100 organizations and there's a hundred businesses and every organization will tap every business for money guarantee you sit on a board of directors we have to go yes, fundraise yes, boom, boom, boom. Yes. <clears throat> every business receives these waves and waves of requests for financial support mm -hmm. the return rate is roughly two to five percent right what i'm fascinated with is is what's in the space between mm -hmm. that organizations and businesses are wasting 95 percent of their time because they only say yes 5% of the time and the charity or the volunteer organization only gets a yes 5% of the time. They've got everything they need inside that box because mm -hmm. they've got all the resources that never grows bigger or smaller. Yeah. Yeah. But the distribution method is, is so competitive that they would rather waste 95% of their time hoping for that new nickel. Yeah. And the business is going, can't you guys just get your act together? And, and so it's like we have everything we need, it just needs to be put together mm -hmm. a new way. And your story mm -hmm. sounds mm -hmm. similar, but in a different sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Getting people to let go, the public to let go, to recognize the, that they need a different voting pattern because there's going to be a new form of political conversation. That's an interesting journey to go down. It, it's an interesting but necessary journey. But getting people to, to go down a different road has to be done through a, a different political process. Like in, in the leadership campaign, it was, it, my whole campaign was about um, province first, politics second. And I demonstrated that in, in many areas that not only I talked about during the campaign, but when I was in finance. I mean, when we did the pension reform, we did it to ourselves. The, the MLA pension plan is the very same as everybody else's. There were no special favors. There, it's no, pro, no more eight-year program. All that stuff is, was the very same, and people that know about it are shocked. So wow, you did that. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, we just started in terms of doing the right thing for the province, 
and it's it's easy to, to you know we'll hear some people criticize about different different things and and I I love the opportunity to discuss them or, or debate them because say okay here here's here's the real story yep. because so many times Dennis what you get is a half of a story yes you just get a piece of it you don't get the whole truth now and I wrote an article about that yeah. um, you know the I didn't call it the rest of the story I think I. I called it um, something like the uh, Plains World. Plains yeah, world. well, yeah, <laughs> telling the, the, the I tell something like along the rest of the story, like here, yeah. here, here are the facts. I think that, that sort of thing, because because people don't necessarily go and spend any time to analyze. They just read whatever headlines yes. out there. Yeah, and newspaper writing. There's the headline. Maybe you catch first paragraph, second last paragraph, closing statement. Done. Yeah, done. And You're and an how, in. so part of that narrative that needs to change is people need to slow down a little bit and but they won't and they have don't. that responsibility to dig a bit deeper. You're right, they do, but I don't I don't see people doing that anytime soon. Hmm. So what has to be visible is a very clear willingness to be different, and and the willingness to be different has to come from different sectors. So in other words, if you if you uh, um, have a lot of people from different camps that are working on the same team for the same mission, the same purpose, to rebuild New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. That is different. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in Dominic Carty join, joining the, with us in the PC camp to help change what's needed to change to fix New Brunswick. Because our mission is, we have one mission, mm -hmm. and that's, that's fixing this province. And fix is in a term that goes well beyond any sort of economic term. Mm -hmm. It's part of it, mm -hmm. but having better health care, best in class in the country. Mm -hmm. Do we know where we rank in the country? And healthcare, right, right. we know we're spending yeah. more mm -hmm. than the average than, than other aspects of the of uh, other provinces, but we don't know where we are in the different aspects of what we deliver for services. But why shouldn't we? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we best in class? Say, same with education. I mean, uh, as a as a bilingual province, and we're graduating less than ten percent of our kids um, uh, bilingual in, in after fifty years. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's that about? Mm -hmm. that, there shouldn't be an excuse for that. It shouldn't be acceptable. And, and when I when I meet with uh, you know different people, the teachers in the classroom, they say the last thing they have to do is have to do is teach. The last thing that's on their agenda because they don't have time to teach. And their classrooms are no longer learning centers. Yep. So when are we going to deal with that? The professionals in the classroom have to be the ones to set curriculum, and we need to determine how good can a can a graduating student be and what should they know when they graduate so that we know we're best in the country, we're best in other countries, and we don't have to get in the middle, because part of the issue on, on the schools has been politicians messing with curriculum in the classroom. I have no interest in doing that. All I want to know is what, is that, what are our students going to know and how do they compare with other provinces so we know they're graduating to be the best. Earlier I wanted to make a small joke because you talked about the need for the um, public to spend some time and dive a bit deeper. Um, because the alternative is, you know, what's happening in the states right now with a president that's doing an awful lot of policy by, you know, so many characters on his tweets. Yes, yes, yes. And and it's driving news cycles. It's it's amazing how it's constantly driving news cycles. Yeah. Maybe a, a gentle segue because uh, uh, I wanted to capture that. So hopefully we won't see. Mr. Higgs out there tweeting all the time in order to get his message across. <laughs> well, uh, you're relatively <laughs> safe on that, I expect. Um, I, I don't think message by tweet is, is, is no. uh, you know, in terms of policy by tweet. Let me put it that way. Message yeah. by tweet is fine, or, or yeah. and Twitter, but, but to, to, um, to have policy by Twitter is another story. Yeah, it would be uh, more like larger conversations. Well, larger conversations, but then a path that people not only can understand, but, but we measure. Yeah. We measure success. Yeah. So if we if we use the the uh, you know an example that I've um, I learned recently and, and I've talked about in different meetings um, in the adoption world in, in the province in in our province so we have well over 400 kids looking to be adopted between the ages of, of newborn and, and and 18 and the demographic that that is the most difficult apparently in terms of placement is 12 to 18. Yes. And, and what was interesting for me is, and of course the timelines to adopt can be three, four, or five years. I mean, it, it's apparently you know, significant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and many would-be parents in that world have given up because it takes so long to connect. I asked the question about what is it, what's the ratio of the number of parents looking for kids versus the number of kids looking for parents. And I was told the numbers are about the same. And I'm thinking, you see, for me, that's a process improvement exercise. Yep. It's like, why can't, if I have a solution here and I have an opportunity here, 
Why can't I connect those dots? And I want to understand the roadblocks. So you do a whole analysis on what are the roadblocks that, and the barriers that pre prevent us from finding the kids and the parents and putting them together. So people think of, when I talk about process improvement or I talk about improve efficiencies or I talk about all this, yeah. these are the things that I'm talking about. I don't need to spend more of your money in order to, to improve the process yeah. and to make sure we get better results. Yeah. I don't need to spend more money to have a better healthcare system or education system. I mean, we, we're spending the money. We're just not getting the results. And it's because we don't even try to get the results. We don't have any sort of oversight or view into, into what do I want to achieve and am I achieving it? Or if I'm not, why am I not? That type of systemic change that you're mapping out in its initial framework um, is going to involve, no matter what sector you aim it at, it's going to involve a pause. Because when you describe the adoption rates and the availability of families and availability of people to be adopted, um, that got built that way for a reason somehow, some way. And probably if we spoke to those people in that world, they would explain, oh, this policy was created because of this and this policy was created because of that. Rarely um, with an eye to the whole process, which is where you're now coming from, and then cleaning it up. Um, I'm sure there's some businesses would say something similar when it comes to what they have to deal with in interacting with government. They find it too onerous for all of the different pieces and parts. So those all speak to a systemic change. But the only way we can get to that is the willingness to have a pause. And so it's interesting. To me, it's one of those ones we have to slow down in order to speed up. You ever heard that little catchphrase sometimes, right? So how fascinating would it be to actually put some systems on pause to have that larger conversation that's going to be needed for all the invested you know, participants to think, and they all have to let go of how they've always done it and then know that they're not risking anything. You're not going to lose your job because right. you didn't follow policy. That's that right. fear element that we... Yes, you need to remove that. Yeah. And then politically, though, is that... Um, Politics have become this whole pattern of predicting outcomes. Pro I'll promise you this, promise you that. Here's the money that goes because I predict these outcomes. You're going to have to invert that model and say we have no idea what's going to happen in terms of concrete outcomes. Oh, actually, no, but, actually. But, but we have targets. Yes. But, uh, uh, but how we get there is going to be very differently than how we've ever gotten that's there That's right. Before. That's exactly right. But, but, how, but in terms of the current model where we'll spend more money and we predict this outcome, so how many times do you hear, I'm going to spend more of your money, and here's what you're going to get for it, in a term that you can say, oh, well, that's great. Like, if I'm going to invest more in education than any, any province per capita, okay, are our kids going to be bilingual by, are they all going to graduate bilingual by the, by the next, in the next 10 years? Are we going to go from eighth place to fifth? in the country in the next 10 years or next five years? I mean, what are we going to achieve for that more money? Oh, well, we don't know. So what, what, I, what I see is that constantly we said, we're going to put more money in healthcare. And people say, oh, well, they accept that. Because yeah, they, they connect. They, they think that's the solution. They think that's the solution. Yeah. And they think if, they, if, if people put more money into something, it's going to get better. History has shown it hasn't. It. it gets more bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. It becomes more difficult to actually get something accomplished, but, but it doesn't necessarily get better unless your money is very clearly directed at a precise outcome and process to achieve it. I should have said earlier not, uh, not outcomes because I'm speaking to you <laughs> and you're focused on outcomes, <laughs> which makes perfect sense because that's it. You know? It was more about guiding principles. Yeah. So, so I was looking for the wiggle room. How does the system find itself some wiggle room and a pause so that they know where they want to go, but they don't know how they'll get there. It has to be something like guiding, oh. like five guiding principles to improve um, education in New Brunswick or healthcare in New Brunswick. And then from those principles, all of these different concrete strategies can start to feed. Well, in. you start you start by saying what do you what do you want to achieve? What's your goal? Hmm. Like where do we want to be? Well, eighth place can't be our goal, hmm. right? Hmm. But if you don't have any goals, you're likely going to get there. But it won't make any difference because the goal wasn't significant to, to do anything anyway. Yeah. But if you have clear goals, then you work backwards and say, okay, what does it take? What are the roadblocks to prevent this from happening? When we brought the process improvement system in play into the government in 2011-12, um, th this whole idea was about looking at systems and the way we actually conducted our work 
and then saying, how can we improve upon that? Are there ways we can get better each and every day to deliver a better result? And we were convinced that certainly there, there were many ways to do that, but how indeed can, uh, does it need to be defined? So what I got encouraged by when people went through this training is they started to take the blinders off. And I've, I went through that very experience myself when, when I was working in my working career in the private sector where I would have people, um, you know, could have been doing something, and I would have been one working in, in, the, in the refinery where I thought we had the best operation in North America. And then uh, we brought in a company to do a benchmark analysis of, of the refinery, and we found that instead of being in first quartile, we are in third. Now, I was in an absolute state of denial initially, because I said, I don't believe it. We, I know we're better than that. Well, then they started showing me all of the things that other companies were doing that we weren't. And I thought, wow, they're really doing that? Best practices. Be uh, and that's exactly right. And adaptable, because things change right under your feet. They on. change all the time. So what the worst thing is people getting in a position that... So that, that basically I can't do anything differently. Mm -hmm. So my philosophy for years was, was uh, and we kind of had this little motto, you know, um, change is good and work is fun. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, if we weren't changing, we, were, we weren't improving. We weren't, we weren't going to survive. So when I get in government and you look at these procedures, there is a culture there that basically I've always done it this way. Mm -hmm. But when I started, uh, when we started this program, I saw people that had been there for 25 and 30 years that were presented an entirely new way to do what they've been doing for years. Well, what's that do for your colleagues that you're presenting to? So you're presenting maybe to people that have been there five years, 10 years, 20, and you've been there 30, and you're gonna say, you know, here's how we need to rethink this. Well, that sends a real message in your training, all of those junior folks, and they're saying, wow, this, this, this individual is changing their view after all this time because they've seen a better improvement. People just have to have a culture of, of always looking to get better. Without knowing the specific details from another era, but it sounds similar to um, a paradigm shift to a degree or a civil service shift to a degree uh, that follows uh, similar to the 1966 Equal Opportunities Act. It's because it's, your story, just as you described it, sounds very much to the homework I've done on, on when um, th those um, people from Saskatchewan came over, the, the New Democrat or Social Credit, um, came over from Saskatchewan, helped Louis Robichaud with tweaking things because New Brunswick was stuck and it needed a new model and this new model surfaced, which today almost haunts us because so many pieces were put into the legislature that should be back in municipalities now, as one example. Um, so it sounds like we need another, we're on the cusp of another shift of that sort, which then gets into the issue of trust. Public is going to have to start to be willing to engage in a different kind of political conversation for the next 18 months leading to the next election to recognize that they've got a role to play in this solution to some of it is is their uh, how do they prep for when they go to vote and the fact that everything um, in the end tends to be emotional mm -hmm. so we can be pragmatic we can be systemic um, we can have all these great concrete things but somewhere down there at the gut level <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, people have to go, yes, this is where we need to go. They do need to take ownership and, and be part of the solution. You're absolutely right. So th this election, is for, for me, it's not about promising more. It's about promising better. Mm -hmm. And people can't come to the, the weakest time of a, of a politician's life cycle every four years and say, oh, if you just promise me this, I'll, um, then I'll, be, uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll vote for you. Mm -hmm. So I, I've, I've never done that in my career through in politics in the six years I've been involved mm -hmm. and I didn't do it through the leadership and I won't do it on, on this, uh, this pending uh, election because if we're not going to change the game in how we think and if we're not going to drive a better behavior politically in how we act then the province isn't going to change anyway so there's no point I might as well retire but if we're going to fix this and people want to be part of that fix then this election is about New Brunswick. And this platform is going to be about New Brunswick and real solutions, real solutions to problems that have plagued us with the only solution being offered, I'll spend more of your money and I'll tax you more and I'll buy your vote next time again. Those are not solutions that are going to turn this province in a direction that's going to fix it. So following that theme, do you have any early indications on different engagement processes with public leading up to the next election? You know, we've done enough studies 
<laughs> in the last number of 20 years yeah. that, the, that the, the, the bureaucrats, the civil servants, you could go into the civil service and just about ask for anything. And they wouldn't tell you necessarily, but they would say, <laughs> yeah, we could look into that. And it'd be amazing in some cases how quickly they could find it. But the other part that is rather disturbing, of course, is that because government's material is always, once one government's gone, new government comes in, then all of the old material is no longer available to any, any government. So they, they repeat their study. Absolutely go out and hire, could hire the same consultant. Just do it all again, present it. In some cases, if it is available, they can re, you can re-reword it, rejig it, and make the new government think that it's something new and how you're going to spin it to the public so they feel like it's something new. And when really it's regurgitated over and over and over again. So when, when, I, when I look at that and I'm saying, okay, how do we get people engaged in, in a process where we're building on success? When, when we got out of government, I met with, with this government, and I went through everything we were doing, all of the procedures, all of the oversight we had in, mm -hmm. in how we manage projects, the details of reporting, the analysis done every month, every quarter, so you could see, are we getting progress, are we not getting progress, so that there wasn't any confusion, and we weren't going to get a surprise, just like we've seen in the, in the Auditor General's report in the last few days. Yes. We wouldn't have seen that. Wouldn't have seen it at all, because the checks and balances were all in place. But all of that team, all of that, those checks and balances were thrown out. And to top it off, and you, you started to mention this, Dennis, of, um, about people in the system and, and, uh, and the building, this, and I was talking about the skill sets. Well, how many times can you keep moving someone through a job? And I think in the, in the case of social development with the discussion, there's been three or four people switch through this job of, uh, of so the Deputy Minister of Social Development in the last four years. Now, not only is that a problem by itself, mm. but what were the qualifications of any of the individuals that came through? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, because did that matter? Or did it only matter that the person was, was uh, friendly to the governing party? So how many times do you keep doing that over and over again? To, so you, you erode the very capability you have by putting someone in a place simply because they breathe. Mm -hmm. They breathe and they're the color of a particular government. That, that indicates a major change in thinking, you know, because it has that's, to change. that's been the pattern. And as best I understand um, some business practices or business homework, um, whenever you change a top position in a system, it would take you two years, two and a half years to get that system back up and running again because that's like a learning curve for that new person. Yes. So when you, you, when you rhyme off, you know, the number of changes that occurred at the top level of the civil service, that's got to have a trickle effect. But it happens every, every election. Time. But in social development, it's been even worse over the last four years. Mm -hmm. but, but in my case, when I retired, I hired my successor two to three years prior to my leaving. Mm -hmm. And that individual went through every department that I was responsible for, Work, work through, I, I worked very closely with, with the individual and, and they were responsible for different, different aspects of, of the transportation sector in this, in this case. And, um, and then when I walked out of my office, this individual walks in. And, and you know, as far as I know, I don't, they may have changed uh, over the while, but certainly four or five years later, he was still there in the same job. Um, and, but, this, and the system didn't have that No, not at all, cycle. because you build a succession plan. And you, you bring people in that, you know, in some cases you walk out of your job after being there for a lot of years and somebody walks right in and the company doesn't blip. You think, well, mm -hmm. whew, what, you know, you kind of like to think that they miss you a little bit. Um, <laughs> but, but, it's, but that wasn't the point. The yeah. point was you build the organization to sustain itself and rebuild and, and keep, keep rebuilding and getting better. In government, we need that same philosophy. We need people that are hired to do, devote their life as a civil servant to turn that back into a job that is admirable, not only because it's, it's working for the province, it's working for the people, but it is delivering such critical services mm -hmm. to the people of the province. Which create that business climate we spoke of at the front end of this That's interview. Right. That's right. That, because they're looking to get a better life for the province. They're looking to get a better life for the people. And so they're interested, have a vested interest in helping their province. But when they see their ideas or their interests or someone comes in and heads up the department that, that would have no reason whatsoever to be there other than a political one. They're saying, why bother? Any efforts I put in are secondary to whatever political whims show up. Which goes back to the emotional theme I alluded to earlier that 
Um, when you find a group finds their rhythm together, it's going to be on an emotional plane first, and then all the other pieces start to fit. We were finding that compared to the discouraged. We were we were close. Stifled. We got to be a close group in the in finance, but we were making allies around the network, and people were coming to us with ideas, and we were finding ways to remove roadblocks and make it happen, and we were becoming an integrated team that was rebuilding New Brunswick. And, and when I saw all of that just thrown away mm. after an election, it, it's a disheartening mm. thing when you think, you know, we're, we're playing with people's lives here. We're playing with better health care. We're playing with better education. Yeah. You know, we're playing with, with better uh, getting people out of poverty. Yep. And yet, politics supersedes all. Yep. What, what, what's that about? Yep. And there's another undercurrent to what you just described. And uh, <clears throat> and I'm just thinking some people in the audience will be sitting there listening to you thinking, yeah, 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 but it'll be the backroom gang that are making all the decisions anyway. But not saying you, I'm thinking that's a systemic challenge. And one of New Brunswick's narratives are that, yes, the civil service can function to a certain level, to a certain way, and then there's the political appointees, and there might not be a skill set that matches the civil service goal or direction. And then right behind that are the ones who are controlling or leveraging or influencing decisions and outcomes that were never elected in the first place. You're right. So, so you're you're, gonna, you're, That is how the system is structured. Mm -hmm. You're correct. So you're going to be running into but, that system, because we've talked about it from kind of one level down, but then there's that other sort of shadow yes, version yes. to address. But, but how does that get created? In many ways it gets created because a whole lot of obligations are made to the to, to get there, right? So someone has worked very hard to get to, and, and you wouldn't get the job unless you have a lot of volunteers and a lot of people yes. that are on side to get there. So you wouldn't you wouldn't get there. However, when the goal is clear, that your your motive, your only interest, is either we're going to this one's for New Brunswick, and the policies and the plan we put forward is going to be clearly for the province. It's not it's not buying votes. It's, it's clearly what's going to change in how we, our everyday life is being impacted, but a, a, a program that goes from here to here on a very clear, defined, measurable uh, outcome and program. And they say, we need you to help us be part of a solution for New Brunswick because all of the trends are going in the wrong direction. Now, can, can, um, can the Premier come, come out next year and say, well, if I get the carbon tax on and I get the marijuana tax on, I might just balance the budget, but we'll be another we'll be three plus billion more in debt, another fifteen billion. Spending is still going on at four and a half five percent, while economic growth is at one or one and a half. It, it you 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 just look at that by itself and say, well, you've taxed us all to the point where you're claiming victory in 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 running in balancing deficit. If we which we would have balanced the deficit. Uh, without the HST, and we'd have been improving service delivery all the while, people would have been shocked. New Brunswick would have been on the map because people would have said, well, how would you do that? Yeah. It's because people in the system were engaged in the solution. It's no great, you know, uh, invention of, of some something like a, or a golden goose that drops the golden egg. Yeah. It's a process that people become more and more engaged in because they too feel an ownership to have a better province. One minute left. How do you want to end? Well, I guess, Dennis, I, I'm convinced the province can be fixed. But it can't be fixed through politics as usual. And if people believe that I'm here uh, for a, a sustainable program within the political world, that is far from the truth. I am here for one reason. I've seen the opportunity. I know how good we can be. I know we need to blur political lines and people from good sides of any party need to be involved and say, this one's for the province. We need your help. Let's design a long-term vision for New Brunswick, not a four-year one. Thank you for this. You're welcome. And thank you for watching. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to dennisatchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.